you know, um, I'm going to actually, I'm going to give a little bit of my background as well, um, but I'm going to rush through some of the projects. I tend to focus only on the biomedical projects today, uh, because I thought, you know, there are more recent, and I thought, you know, I'd like to, what, I, what I'm, what I'd like to do in the school is actually to promote healthcare uh, and uh, biomedical engineering sort of themes. So. I'm going to focus on some of these projects. These are some of the current and very latest projects I've been doing uh, on biomedical applications. Um, so the team that are focusing on, on biomedical, uh, we've got Anderson and Antonius here, but the rest are not here. Um, um, so these are the people actually, so I'm taking credit of, of the work that these guys have done, uh, really. Uh, um, so I'm just showing some of the things that we've been going through. Very quick background, as, as Nick mentioned, I've, I've done all my degrees, undergrad, master's, PhD uh, in here, uh, and left um, Manchester you know, in 2010. I, started, I, I got a uh, EPSRC fellowship for about a year, so I stayed on here about a year, then went to industry, uh, and I went, I went across the road to, to MMU. Uh, I was there in, uh, as a lecturer in computational fluid dynamics, and then um, I was deputy director of a research center, and then came returned to MACE uh, just this summer. Um, now, I, you know, obviously my back background, my PhD was on nuclear engineering, turbulence modeling. Some of you actually are working in that field, uh, looking at all the RANS models and you know some EDS as well for nuclear applications. My, my PhD was funded by the nuclear industry, uh, EDF, and um, British Council through EPSRC. Um, so. I'm still doing that. We still publish papers in that area, uh, but then uh, you know. In the past few years, I, I got interested more in, in biomedical applications and really, really on the application side of, of CFD, um, you know, as opposed to fundamental stuff. Now, the first one is really the beginning of what inspired me to, to do CFD, uh, you know, and, and biomedical. Um, we, we, we participated in, an, um, in a challenge. It, it was a blind channel uh, challenge, looking at two patient-specific aneurysms. Aneurysm, as you know, is the swelling in the in the in the vessel, blood vessel. It could be in, in, in the brain, which is intracranial, or it could be in um, in the main aorta, which would be aortic aneurysm. Um, and we wanted to know which one of these aneurysms actually ruptured. We knew that one of them ruptured uh, from the clinical data, but we didn't know which one. Um, and the question really was, if you were a surgeon and you had limited resources, which one of these aneurysms would you go for uh, first you know, in terms of doing the operation on? So the first thing we did was really running the simulation, uh, steady state simulation initially, and then on a steady simulation, uh, looking at some hemodynamic fact forces, including wall shear stress, time average wall shear stress, um, and then uh, this is the, the transit time with actual patient-specific flow rates uh, as the uh, pulse, pulsating inlet uh, flow. Um, and looking at wall shear stress, you will see wall shear stress in my presentation quite a bit. Uh, it's because it's one of the main outputs uh, that we will use in, our, in the analysis of our data. And the pressure as well. And looking at areas, for example, now we were, we were trying to focus on areas where we have the lowest uh, wall shear stress. Um, which represents areas which are prone to, to rupture. Um, and also there are ad more advanced uh, hemodynamic metrics as well, such as OSI, oscillatory shear index, which sort of represents the os oscillatory um, factor of, of the flow. So where you have more oscillation or secondary flow, you will get higher OSI. Now, after submitting the results, uh, we were told actually that this was the exact location of, of rupture. Now, if you compare to where we had the lowest wall stress, stress distribution and the highest OSI, you can actually start see that the, the actual location of rupture was less than a millimeter away from where we predicted blindly. This is actually, for me, it was actually very inspiring and very interesting. Um, and it was the beginning of moving into more um, complicated sort of applications and actually developing what, what we're working on now is developing a new treatment technique based on our knowledge in fluid mechanics. The good thing about combining the discipline of fluid mechanics and biology is that we as engineers, we will look at problems you know, from out of the box, really. You know, we have different approaches to problems, and this sometimes actually could, could be confusing, sometimes it could be actually quite inspiring and quite interesting. Now, this is one of the projects uh, that we are working on now, working on a new method uh, with some surgeons in order to come up with um, a new method for uh, treatment of aneurysms, especially large aneurysms in, in the brain. Um, um, and it's both CFD and in vitro, which means experimental stuff, you know, doing with physical, uh, having physical setup. 
Um, and the the uh, CFT part really involves FSI, which we've done some initial uh, FSI on, uh, on, uh, on you know, as a pro sort of proof of concept, but the, the actual FSI needs to be a lot more complicated um, and more complex models. Um, now, I'm just quickly going to go move on to the second project, which is on heart pumps. Um, now, you've heard about um, heart failure. Heart failure is one of the biggest issues now, especially uh, for people over 65, is one of the major challenges uh, for the healthcare system. Um, especially the cost of operation and surgery is extremely expensive. Um, if, you, if, if someone suffers from a, from a heart failure, um, you would either need transplant, which, you know, as you know, you know, very few or sort of uh, donation or organs actually are available for transplants, or you will use one of these pumps um, as a um, destination therapy, which means you will have this pump until uh, you know pass away, really. Uh, um, and the, the, the function of this pump is extremely important. Um, each of these pumps costs about seventy to eighty thousand pounds. They're very small, and the operation, you know, overall cost of the operation is about one hundred and forty, one hundred fifty thousand pounds per per patient. Now, the thing which we're looking at now here is not mainly the actual design of the pump, uh, but it's actually the, at, the, uh, it, at the level where the cannulite, this is what we call cannulite, outflow is connected to the main aorta. Now, as a surgeon, um, you, you have your own technique uh, in terms of you know, how you would suture this cannulite to the aorta, but from a fluid dynamic point of view, it's quite important at what angle, what diameter, uh, and what orientation you will connect this, you know, the actual anastomosis, this is what the, the junction is called, anastomosis. Now, um, what we're doing in this analysis, in this, uh, in this study, is, is looking at each of these aorta. Uh, this is a patient-specific model from a female, 23-year-old female. So it's a very accurate representation of, of the aorta. You can see we've got lots of branches, um, hence the outlet boundary condition would be quite challenging um, to be accurate. Um, you also have the cannulite coming to the, to the aorta, and then we need to be playing with different parameters in order to sort of look at the effects of each parameter and, and try to come up with some sort of best practice guidelines for surgeons. Um, what we're doing in this graph is a sort of a quantitative analysis, and what you see Moving from test zero to test six, uh, these represent different level of heart failure. So heart failure is not a zero or one um, sort of function. You could have 10% failure, you could have 20%, 30%, etc. What we have, we are combining the difference between, or we're looking at the level or severity of heart failure, and how the interaction between the flow from AR, which is the aortic root, and the left ventricle assist device, which is essentially the heart pump, what is the interaction between the two? So we are, move, we are changing the flow rate in between the two to represent different heart failure rates uh, and then to try to look at the data. What is interesting is, uh, is that, for example, in here, I'm showing the ice surfaces of the time average velocity. Um, from a fluid dynamic point of view, if you are accelerating the flow from the aorta, there are two associated phenomena. Uh, phenomenon with that. The first one is that you are increasing the impingement on the curvature of the aorta. The second thing is that you are essentially blocking the flow from going into these, uh, these arteries, subclavian and carotid arteries, which means this actually could cause a stroke. So one of the complete complexities of, of um, LVAD operation is that if, if you're not setting this up correctly, you might actually, the patient would actually could suffer from, from, um, uh, from stroke due to the lack of perfusion or lack of flow going to the, to the brain. So that accuracy is quite important. That combination of flow rate uh, and hemodynamic parameters is, is very important. What we're looking at here is if this is the natural flow, and you can see actually there's very low velocity around in here, by, by putting this counter line on the side, you need to make sure that the flow condition and the velocities and turbulence in the aorta, as well as all these arteries are are assessed carefully, uh, and then this sort of provides some sort of guidelines um, for for the, for the surgeon. Similarly, you can look at the streamlines and look at, for example, naturally this is what you would get in the body. So you would get some sort of dean vortices in the aorta, in the aortic arc. Um, and when you introduce this unnatural uh, canon line, naturally you have to think about how you can improve and maintain that natural motion of the blood flow. Um, and this is what we're looking at in this case, which we're looking at the time average velocity and looking at how, sorry, how these changes 
or at what level of heart failure um, you would get sort of flow interaction uh, in the subclavian arteries, carotid arteries, and um, the uh, aortic arc. It's not only, we're not only looking at the, the results qualitatively, we also look at quantitative data as well. So we try to, for example, introduce um, different sections. So these are different planes or different strips around the geometry. And we are measuring the average, uh, time average values of the hemodynamic conditions, such as time average while stress stress, oscillatory shear index, we've covered these two in the past uh, on the aneurysm case. And the third one is the relative resonance time. These are shown here as well. These are the three of the main parameters that we're going to be looking at. So we've got these three parameters to assist us in terms of understanding the flow. When you look at the channel flow, for example, in CFT, you look at maybe uh, friction flow, uh, sorry, uh, friction factor, you're looking at pressure, you're looking at, at velocity. These are not going to be sufficient when it comes to biomedical applications. You need to do more analysis on the actual results. And these are some of the things that we're doing, uh, post-processing data using these parameters. The third case um, is, um, is looking at a very common condition uh, called atherosclerosis, which is the position of fatty deposits and, and cholesterol in the arteries, which would cause stroke, which would, which would cause heart attack, and other conditions. It's, it's one of the most common conditions, uh, or one of the most uh, type of uh, cardiovascular diseases. Um, this work was in collaboration with Imperial College, uh, and looking at a very accurate um, aortic model of a rabbit um, and as you know rabbits have very similar cardiovascular system to, to humans and, and therefore this actually represents a very nice um, um, correlation between uh, you know animals and human um, cardiovascular system um, what we are looking at here again on a steady flow looking at positile blood flow in the artery um, and some specific areas are quite interesting to us so when you look at, for example, areas such as here and here, you realize that something abnormal is going on. So you have, for example, exceptionally low ball stress stress around here and in here. And even if you look at the turbulence structures, uh, you know, key criteria and vortex, uh, vortices, um, you can also see some, some um, strange or unusual um, flow condition appears around these areas. Now, these are quite interesting for us. Um, Especially one of the things that we did in this project was to compare our results against um, in vivo data. When we say in vivo data, that means the data taken from a real animal or real patient or real um, you know, um, um, creature really. So um, in this case, for the same type of rabbit, this data on the right hand side represent using the oil red O dye, it's essentially a dye which would uh, it's fat soluble, which means it would sort of indicate areas of fatty deposits uh, in the artery. So these are areas which are prone to development of the condition. Now, by looking at, so we've modeled exactly the same um, configuration. We are now focusing on this side of the uh, of the artery. If I start modifying my wall shear stress distribution and start highlighting the minimum and the maximum, or try to highlight the extreme high and low areas, I end up with some sort of interesting map or correlation between the data and the CFD. Now, here, blue represents very low wall shear stress uh, or, uh, distribution, and red represents high wall shear stress distribution. Now, if I start comparing this pattern with this pattern, you can see that areas where I have blue or maybe grayish, these are areas where I have um, the, uh, the deposition of fat, fatty deposits. Uh, and areas where I have red, they're mostly clean without any deposits around there. So there is this, you know, immediately it might suggest that there is a correlation between wall stress stress and areas which are prone to deposition. Of course, in reality, this is far more complex than that. This is an isolated case, and there are contradicting theories about this as well, but it highlights the importance of of CFD in relation to predicting areas in patients or in animals where they're prone to, to growth of, of atherosclerosis. Now, what is the impl implication of that? Implication is, if, if I could take the CT scan of, of your uh, arterial you know, cardiovascular system, and if I could model that using the same technique, 
I could, I could potentially identify areas which are more prone to developing this condition. And therefore, we could predict, for example, what type of, band, what type of cardiovascular disease you will, you, you know, you're likely to develop in your lifetime. Imagine that would be one of the applications in terms of preventive um, uh, method. Um, one of the other things which out of our, you know, from a CFD or numerical point of view, one of the interesting project, uh, projects that we did was also to look at the effects of um, changing the boundary condition. As you know, outlet boundary condition is particularly important in geometries where you have lots of different outlets, uh, like this, this aortic model. Um, and we tried looking at uh, Morris law, which is essentially relating the mass flow rate in each artery uh, to be dependent on the diameter of the artery to the power of three, or using combining the Morris law with some data from the in vivo um, analysis that, that uh, other researchers have done on the same uh, geometry, and the normal popular traction free, which you just define, you know, zero pressure at the outlet, and, and you run the simulation. Um, surprisingly, you get very diff you get very different analysis and very different results, really, when you compare these three, which highlights the importance of choosing the right band type boundary condition uh, you know, that, that in your simulation. At the same time, it raises questions about how, you know, about the accuracy of CFD in biomedical applications. Of course, this is something that we need to address, like any other case, uh, like even you know, uh, in the previous talk, we had about uh, roughness. Still comparing those with experimental data and DNS is, is, is still important, it's far, far more important um, in biomedical applications to, to compare your simulations against those data as much as you can. Um, and then for the same analysis, again, we're looking at um, comparing the, uh, the distributions that you've got from different methods as opposed to um, the, the data. Now, the last project um, that I want to talk about is about directly using the, uh, the knowledge of fluid flow uh, in, in uh, biomedical applications and, and cardiovascular surgery. Um, one of the, you might have heard about grafts uh, and bypass grafts. Um, if you have, you, you know, that the main application of bypass graft is, is in heart, uh, where you have blocked arteries. This is the bypass operation that um, is, is conducted on, on the coronary arteries. Or maybe in the leg, if you're suffering from diabetes or if you're suffering from atherosclerosis, some of the, some of the uh, arteries in, in the leg get blocked and you need to use a graft in order to bypass the blocked region. Another application of graft is where you have, uh, for example, if a patient has diabetes and they have kidney failure, um, they, they need to be connected to the hemodialysis machine, which is, so don't, you know, which does sort of the function of, of what the kidney does uh, externally. Um, and what you need to do is you need to connect two of the, uh, you know, the vein and the, uh, and the artery, bring them together so that you get enough mass flow rate and then connect that to the, uh, to the hemodialysis machine. Now, our concern is about this region, the graft connection. This configuration is exactly the same here and in here. So wherever you have a bypass graft connected to the host artery, you have a configuration which is of concern. Uh, and I'm going to mention why that is important. Results show that some of these, or actually a big portion of, of these bypass operations, will fail because of something called IH, um, developing intimal hyperplasia, developing around the junction. So imagine this is the artery which was blocked. This is the, the bypass graft which the surgeon has placed. After some time, normally if it fails, it will fail within the, next, within the first 30 days. These are the regions which will develop IH, which is essentially swelling, if you like, of, of, the, uh, of the layer, um, uh, and it will block the, the artery, which means the, 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 the operation will fail. Um, when you look at this, as a fluid dynamic sort of expert or, or researcher, you will probably, probably get an impression that something is going on around the heel and the toe and the arterial flow. If you think about a standard sort of, um, you know, maybe T-junction, what you will see um, is that here is the impingement, here is the separation region, and you, might, you may start relating the fluid dynamic concepts to what is actually happening in the body. Um, and in fact, this was the beginning of, of the analysis that, that we started a few years ago, like in fact, 2015, um, and this was 
inspired by the work that Professor Kara has done at Imperial College, where he showed that if you have a normal tube and you inject some dye, this is the sort of a mixing that you would get. Now, if you start twisting this tube, so imagine out, you know, out of plane helicity um, in this in this tube, <clears throat> you will get a far far better mixing in there. Now, based on that, they've designed a uh, helical stent, which later on in clinical analysis showed that by using that sort of approach, um, you will avoid having fatty deposits in the artery because of that twist in the, in the uh, arterial system. This was fantastic, this was a very, in fact, this was a breakthrough in, uh, in cardiovascular surgery <clears throat> in, you know, in 2005. Um, based on that, we were inspired to look at the helical model and start looking at different ways that you could induce that helicity in the, in the graft. Now, there are two ways. One is what, sorry, one is what um, Professor Kara has done, which is out of plane helicity or helical uh, graft. The other one is maybe inducing helicity using an internal ridge. So you put a ridge inside and you try to force the flow to follow that ridge, therefore, you would induce some secondary flow. And then, of course, you have the, the option of combining the two and producing that case, which is a spiral plus out of plane helicity. This was the subject <coughs> of our paper, um, which recently got published uh, in PLOS ONE. Um, there is a comparison between our results and uh, some in vitro analysis uh, on the same setup. So trying to compare what we have got numerically compared to, compared to what it would happen in reality using vector uh, Doppler imaging, um, very close correlation can be found, uh, and which essentially gives confidence to you, and then you can carry on with more analysis on your using your CFT technique. Um, so what we're trying to do here really is looking at different planes along the artery and looking at what happens with each model. So we are we are looking at four different models, as you can see in here, and we are looking at how the flow behaves as you go on in the, in the artery. Again, <clears throat> what is important is just not looking at the normal um, parameters such as velocity and pressure, but deriving the, um, the hemodynamic, specific hemodynamic conditions uh, or parameters which are specific to this, uh, to this application. Now, we've got five of them here including some of the conventional ones and some of the, uh, the more recently developed ones, such as the transverse loss stress, which was developed a few years ago. Um, this geometry which you're looking at is this section and then opens up. So you can see the distribution very clearly. Now, we have some guidelines in terms of um, the effects of the, uh, the hemodynamic conditions. For example, what we're looking for in terms of OSI is that OSI, the bigger the OSI, the worse it is for the, for the hemodynamic condition. Therefore, if you're reducing the amount of OSI within your graft, it's actually improving. I mean, you can actually see that the uh, average OSI is reducing as you start going from control to spiral, from spiral to helical, and then combining helical and spiral would give you the minimum amount of OSI. Um, so based on those analyses, I don't want to go through the details, they managed to come up with sort of a proof of concept of, of a uh, bypass graft which will be, which will, is based on combining the spiral and the helicity uh, in the graft. This was a massive collaboration between different institutes um, and received some funding from EPSRC uh, along with some match funding from different other institutes. And in fact, that sort of analysis or that sort of idea which initially might you know may sound strange to to clinicians turned out to be you know to have something which would be potentially very high impact uh, with lots of different um, headlines really um, on, on that design now um, the, I think the next the next few slides I want, I want to talk about optimization of, of what we've done on the on the graph I don't think, I think it's going to be, shall I, shall I stop? Because I think it's just going to be too long if I want to go through those slides. I think I'm going to leave it here, uh, but uh, I'm just going to, uh, we've done a lot of analysis, a lot of optimization on, on the graph, uh, 
including you know, multi-object optimization, um, and we've managed to publish a number of publications um, in the past few years on, on those. Um, and I think that's it. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you.